we are a uh, fairly recent company. We, we essentially started in 2014. We're a company that focuses on acquiring and redeveloping mature oil fields, mainly for major oil companies. Um, as these fields mature and decline in production, they become inefficient for these major companies to, to operate, um, let's say, at, uh, at peak capacity. So what we do is, since we're smaller, since we're able to, to focus on smaller assets, we buy these fields, we reduce their costs, increase their production, and extend their useful life uh, through this strategy. As you can see, over the last few years, we were able to grow quite a bit. Uh, we grow, like I said, mainly through acquisitions and organically, and organically through investing in these fields that we acquire. At the moment, we operate um, two different clusters, as we like to call. Uh, one cluster, the Poland, the Buena Mandel cluster, is the south of the campus basin. The other, the Fragi and Wahoo cluster, is the north of the campus basin here in Brazil. Um, and we, as those are, you know, two fields joined together and operating through a single platform. Um, in the upper right corner here of this slide, you can see our track record of acquisitions, the ones we've made over the, the last few years. Uh, this most recent one, the 90% of Albaquara Leish or Albaquara East field um, that we that we signed in April of this year is not yet uh, reflected in our production numbers. Um, at the same time, we don't uh, we've we've put new wells online um, in the third quarter of this year, which are also not yet reflected in our numbers. Um, but as you can see, we've been able to grow production and uh, reserves quite a bit over over the last few years. Uh, this is an overview of our assets. Uh, as you can see here in the in the map in this slide. Uh, in the south of the campus basin, we have this cluster that operates together. Both of these fields, all of their wells, uh, produced through a single FPSO, the Bravo FPSO, that you, you can see there on the right, these images on the right. Um, and the, the Fraj fields in the north uh, operates through the, the Valenti FPSO, that's the first image there. And the Wahoo field is also going to produce through the Fraj field FPSO. Abacaralesh, like I said, is an, a recent acquisition. It's a separate asset. It has its own FPSO, the P50, um, as you can see in the last image down there. Uh, we will not be joining that production to Fraj, at least not, uh, uh, not right now, because obviously the two FPSOs together don't have capacity to produce all of the oil uh, from all of these few, uh, you know, each FPSO doesn't have the capacity to produce all of the oil from all of these fields, so we have to keep uh, production separate between those two assets. Here in this slide, this table uh, already includes the increased production in the Fraji field from uh, drilling this these new wells in the middle of this year, about July, they, they came into production. And we are considering the production from Albaquara Leish or Albaquara East here, which could take our production to up, up to around 75,000 barrels a day. As you can see in the second, light, uh, second line here, of the, uh, the table. Uh, here's just a, a, a quick overview of what we've been able to do in the fields that we've acquired. Uh, here on the left side is how we're able to reduce costs in these fields. Uh, the Polo field, which was the first one we acquired, we started operating that in about 2014. Uh, under the previous operator, it had quite a different cost profile. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, the bear markets in the uh, oil industry uh, from, let's say, 2013 or 14 up until 2016 uh, helped a lot in reducing costs. That's when the company essentially was growing up, let's say. That's how we were, um, you know, the, the, the uh, cost discipline culture here in the company was formed. And because of that, we, uh, we, we, we've become quite proficient uh, in finding where excess costs and unnecessary costs, and sometimes you know um, even things that are uh, superfluous to the point of being unsafe, uh, come into our operations, and we're able to to remove those and, and become much leaner. Uh, through those cost reductions and through uh, the the increased production that we've been able to get over the last few years, 
we've been able to push back abandonment dates. Uh, as you can see in the, here in the middle of the slide, uh, we've been able to consistently push back expected abandonment dates for the Povo field, uh, now Povo and Tubaro Martelo together, uh, over the last few years. This last year, uh, because of, of a couple of issues with one of the wells in Povo, the expected life decreased a little bit, but it's still quite significantly above uh, what we expected it to be. And to the right side, we have given an example here, but uh, production, for example, in the side field has decreased quite a bit. Uh, we, we were, we, when we acquired the field in 2019, it produced around 15,000 barrels a day, uh, about 20,000 barrels a day, I'm sorry. Uh, over the years, obviously, it declined in production a little bit. It was earlier this year, it was producing uh, around 15,000 barrels a day. We added two new wells that increased production by around 18,000 barrels a day. The field is now producing just over 30,000 barrels, which is another example of, of how we've been able to increase production. Um, here it showed, just shows you know, our increase in production over the years. This left side shows other oil producers in Brazil, and it compares our oil production back in 2014 when we were starting out and now, uh, including all of our assets and, and production increases. And then you can see you know, how we've been able to not only replace the reserves that we've produced over the years, but increase them quite significantly as well. And uh, the bottom right side of the screen, you can see that these, those were done by the attractive prices. Uh, you know, I've talked a lot about our strategy here, but obviously we're uh, we're you know we're a company with shareholders. We're listed here in Brazil, um, and we do have a uh, fiduciary duty of of, of trying to, to uh, make our operations be profitable and, and make decent returns for shareholders, which means we can these acquisitions at, at attractive prices. Uh, here is a bit of a bit more of a track record uh, of of our acquisitions how we've acquired these assets over the years. Uh, they were quite a bit of, quite a few assets. We've, uh, we've had experience now uh, in dealing with quite a few, with most of the major oil companies that, uh, that are present here in Brazil. We've made several acquisitions from BP. We've acquired uh, Merck's interest in the whole field when they were leaving Brazil in 2015 to 16. Uh, we've acquired uh, over 50% of the flag field from Chevron. Uh, we've recently made another acquisition from BP and Total, and obviously we've we've acquired an asset from Petrobras. Uh, we've tried to acquire other assets from Petrobras. The price wasn't always quite there; wasn't still, uh, uh, always at the point that we needed to to justify those acquisitions. But um, you know, we were able to at least get this one last asset back uh, in April of this year. Um, here just shows you know uh, our production, uh, our uh, reserves increased again, and uh, the reduction we've been able to get in our listing costs over the years. Uh, a lot of this has been the uh, the actual reduction in, in uh, operating costs in our fields over uh, you know the, the previous operator, but this has also been a lot of uh, synergy extractions uh, when you have more than one field operating in the same basin. We're able to share a lot of services, such as you know, supply vessels and helicopter uh, flights to take people to and from these platforms, um, areas, uh, ports areas to, to house equipment. All of these you can you know consolidate and, and extract significant synergies from. And then the last part of this is being able to increase production uh, quite a bit helps also in reducing our, our lifting. This is more of a track record in how we've in, in the operational side rather than the rather than the acquisition side. Um, this what we're currently doing in this track five revitalization. We've drilled two production wells so far, and uh, we we've drilled one inject injection well, and are in the middle of the second one. Uh, like I said, these first two production wells have increased production by around eighteen thousand barrels, and we expect the last two wells. To increase uh, production by another maybe seven or eight thousand barrels a day, which should uh, also, you know, other than increase production, help us uh, continue reducing our lifts costs as well. And yeah, that's that's it. Uh, very quick overview, very brief. Uh, obviously, if anyone has any doubts or questions for any of the previous slides, uh, I'll be happy to go over that. And you know, if anybody has any other questions, I'll also be happy.
<laughs> Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation about independence and new companies going into and competing with major oil companies, um, which is generally the trend of the oil and gas industry, uh, previously dominated by the IOCs, and now to see an independent company like yours coming in and, and taking assets from the major companies and competing with them on the same level and so on. Very interesting, um, very, very good case study for us. Uh, if you want to kind of like get the insight about the industry, the dynamics of companies and so on in the industry. Um, so I'm going to open the floor for any questions. Thank you very much. You. Um, just, you know, before any questions, yeah, this, this market in Brazil has never really been developed because production here has been concentrated a lot, especially in the hands of Petrobras. But these, let's say, uh, uh, a second wave of companies to operate these mature fields are starting up here in Brazil. But it's already a, a sort of an established market in the North Sea and in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, since those are you know much more developed, much more mature assets, and they have a whole ecosystem around these smaller fields that have declined and how to to you know revise blood cells. But yeah, uh, for sure. Sorry, uh, any if, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to. Excellent. So we have a question. Yeah. Um, can you hear me from, from there? Uh, yeah, I think I can. All right. Cool. Thank you for your uh, presentation. So my initial, my question is, uh, looking at the what I said, a contractual journey, uh, for a company like Preo, like you said, we started since twenty fourteen, uh, getting into loads of deals with uh, players in the industry that have been there forever like Petrobras and so on. Um, what is the beginning, uh, you know, balance in terms of getting into the various contract the acquisition? What is the, the if, 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 if I could put it this way, could you give some insight into the backroom uh, negotiations and how you arrive at contracts? Are you stuck to model contracts that are determined by uh, Petrobras and other actors that you need to deal with? You say, uh, uh, excuse me, before you answer the question, is it possible to stop sharing the screen and maybe yeah, sure, sure. share your image on the screen for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. Come, excellent. Of course, of course. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, hi, a little good morning to everyone again. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, at this point, it's been uh, easier talking to major oil companies since you have something of a track record in operating these fields and in acquiring these seals from majors. But at the beginning, it was quite hard to get them to take us seriously. We didn't have as much of a track record. And these companies tend to be worried about selling these assets and then having these smaller companies, uh, you know, with uh, what they view as, and in some cases correctly, uh, lower safety standards, you know, lower uh, uh, financial capacity to operate these fields. And obviously they're scared of selling these, these assets and then having a local regulator um, be uh, uh, holding them responsible for anything that the, the, you know, the buyer of these assets uh, may do incorrectly. So the, the, the uh, efforts in getting them to sit down and, to, and, and negotiate properly and drafting out the contracts that make sense for everyone uh, involves a lot uh, convincing these companies that you're able to operate these seals efficiently at very high safety levels. You're not going to, you know, uh, injure people. You're not going to uh, spill any oil. You're not going to, you know, cause any environmental accidents or, or anything of that sort. And it, it takes it. Uh, it's taken quite a bit for us to develop a reputation as you know safe operators, as efficient operators and uh, being able to, to get at a level where we have the financial stability to also you know, be able to operate these assets through you know, downturn in oil prices, um, where, uh, where we'll be able to, to still honor our commitments to uh, regulators and abandoned fields and depositing guarantees, you know, in case anything happens. Um, but yeah, it takes some time, for sure. Uh, it's, uh, but at that point, we're at a point right now where, where it's become a lot, a lot easier to sit down with them 
in the beginning, uh, we, we sort of uh, were lucky to be able to take advantage of uh, a point in oil prices where uh, BP and Maersk were just selling assets because they wanted to leave Brazil. Um, but right now, you know, we've, we've been able to operate these deals for, for a while and we're able to concretely show numbers, um, on, you know, other than just plans that we had at the time, which, you know, thankfully worked out. Uh, we were able to now show numbers in our track record in, in actually operating these deals without any accidents, any oil spills, and, you know, sort of uh, uh, damage to either people or the environment. Can I just add something? Uh, Pedro, you just bought massive avocado under the divestment program and under the divestment program Petrobras has its own model agreement right. which is quite similar to what we have farm outs and farming farm outs under the AIEN model right. so it's not different but it's their own model the companies can make uh, alterations when they bid right. and it's negotiated during the, during the process so, so is there like a heavy reliance on model agreements or is the Lots of um, alterations that are made and, and various deals that are. You can make alterations when you bid, but it will be analyzed by Petrobras as a part of your price. Mm -hmm. So you, if you make too much operation, uh, alterations, Petrobras yeah. can you know say that your proposal was not as good as okay. the one that the other company made that they did not okay. change as much as you did the agreement. Okay. And if you are, your proposal is the one that was uh, picked up for to start the negotiation phase, you can negotiate the agreement, and then afterwards you go to call, to signing and under the different scenario, and you can include you know liabilities and uh, and any retention liability that can stay with Petrobras and etc. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. You say. Um, Barbara was just uh, explaining uh, the uh, framework for uh, agreements in, that Petrobras is using, like uh, the, the standard terms and conditions of Petrobras, and and uh, also like because they are standard agreements, they can be adapted. But but I guess Petrobras don't like it to be too much adapted <laughs> and, and to stay open yeah. in, in the philosophy. So so by the way, I I, I think you also know that we have. Uh, Barbara Bettencourt here from Demarest here, and also Alicia Anna. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, Petrobras uh, can be somewhat flexible, but they're not the, the most flexible uh, negotiating partners we've, we've ever had, right? <laughs> they do have uh, these standard contracts they, they draw up, uh, also in, in selling uh, these fields, but there is some leeway in what's, uh, what you can negotiate with them. Um, if you go beyond that, then they open up the contracts again to a bunch of different bidders, and you have to start from zero. So it's uh, there's a bit of an art there to you know, to what point you can push them. Excellent, thank you. So another question. Um, hi, Jose. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, my name is John Kalberg. I teach in the law school at Robert Gordon University. Uh, thank you very much for that excellent presentation on your journey since 2014. My question is a simple one. Um, when you acquire assets, um, and you've acquired a lot, do you also acquire the decommissioning liabilities? We do, yeah. Uh, here in Brazil, we, the, the operator of the field is responsible for decommissioning that deal. Um, depending on your size and on the state of the field, you either have to you know, post up uh, tax or corporate guarantees uh, for the decommissioning of those assets. But at the end of the day, the, the regulator here will hold the operator responsible for actually uh, executing the, the, the abandonment or the decommission. Which means it's, yeah, we, it's, uh, it's a concern for us, just in the sense that obviously it's, uh, it represent, represents a quite significant financial uh, commitment. Uh, but uh, also that, you know, um, especially here in Brazil, there's not much experience, sorry, uh, there's not, not much experience with abandoning assets. And, uh, and you know, you, you need uh, suppliers and all sorts of different equipment for that. So we, you do need to, to be aware and on your feet for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, any of those needs that you have. 
what we've been able to do is we've been able to uh, premature, not prematurely, but uh, uh, anticipate the abandonment of you know non non producing wells in some fields, but it's it's very minor compared to actually decommissioning the whole field. Uh, and uh, Jose, connected to that, so you put up some type of bond uh, for the estimated decommissioning cost. What actually happens if the decommissioning cost is more than your bond? Well, uh, what you have, that can happen, but there are steps taken to, to prevent that from happening, which is mostly that uh, the, the decommissioning, the value of, of the expected value of, what, of, of the decommissioning of the field um, is, is not something like just a number that we think of, right? We have to actually get quotes from suppliers. We have to have firm quotes. If we were to decommission the field today, what that would cost, we present that to A&P, the oil regulator here in Brazil. They have to sign off on that. And then you have, you have sort of, uh, let's say, quote quotes, official uh, value, you know, estimated value for, for the decommissioning. And then you post a bond on that. And then you have to um, update that figure I, I don't remember if it's annually or twice uh, yeah. or, or uh, every two years, uh, but then you update that figure. You know, as time goes on, obviously, so that those prices aren't uh, aren't very out of date, and uh, hopefully that you know keeps you in line uh, with with what you actually Thanks. will spend on the commission. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any more questions? Oh, well, I just asked this other question. How do you deal with disputes? Um, what's the most common way you ask like, to resolve disputes if they arise? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that. How do, I, how do we deal with disputes? Disputes. Oh, disputes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it depends a little bit on who the dispute is with, right? If it's a partner inside, like in one of your fields, if it, he's uh, sort of, you know, it's a consortium, it's a partner in the consortium. Uh, generally speaking, there are, there's a, a contract called the JOA, a Joint Operating Agreement, uh, between the parts in the consortium, and that defines how to solve several disputes. And, you know, most of the time, the, it defines also that if you have a dispute that can't be resolved through the mechanisms stated out in this contract, you go to arbitration, right? And generally it's uh, arbitration in the courts of London. Um, we're actually involved in one arbitration right now. Uh, and and those get resolved usually fairly well and usually fairly quickly. Um, other than that, if it's disputes with, I don't know, maybe let's say labor or uh, I don't know, uh, people like, uh, let's say settlements on the coast of Brazil that for some reason have some have a problem with you or anything regarding that, it usually goes to like court of law here in Brazil. So those are, are usually the, the method, methods to settle those disputes. Um, if you're talking about like acquisitions, then yeah, you're, you're just negotiating with, uh, with your partner, with whoever's selling the assets. And if you have any disputes of, of some kind, usually just the deal just doesn't go through that instead of actually, or either you resolve it commercially, like in terms of reaching an agreement or the deal just isn't working. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, very informative and insightful about the Brazilian uh, oil and gas industry and in particular your company uh, involved in so many aspects of the industry in Brazil. So thank you very much for that presentation directly from Brazil and it was successful. There were no interruptions or anything like that so we are quite happy. And, uh, so please join me to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions at some point, uh, you can reach out. I think maybe you guys have my contact information. If not, uh, you can talk to either Bar Barbara or Aliciana. They both have my my contact information, and I'll be happy to answer any further questions that anybody has. Excellent. Thank you very much and for, for making the time. And have a beautiful day in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Have a good day to you as well. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.
So 